Welcome to this year's virtual imaging symposium. Good morning to all participants from Europe and good afternoon to all the participants from Asia. Since I'm not expecting anyone from America at this time, I'm happy if instead somebody um, joins us and I share my respect for you for your great will to get everything from the Virtual Imaging Symposium. So my name is Matthias Beford. I'm a clinical trainer at the Heidelberg Engineering Academy and will guide you through the program in the workshop channel. Over the next two days, my colleagues will give you tips and tricks on all imaging modalities with the Spectralis HRA plus OCT and the Anterion. Additionally, there will be a session on healthcare IT and capabilities of HiX EMR and HiX2. For each session of topics, a colleague from the Heidelberg Engineering Academy in the UK will join in either at the beginning or at the end, or Ethan Priel will join us live from Israel to provide additional information and thus make the day very varied. For longtime fans of the Heidelberg Engineering Academy and for distributors who use this event for their own training, some of the faces will certainly look familiar. Our first topic in the workshop channel is basics in multimodal retinal imaging. Before my colleague Grit Leuner will demonstrate how to use multimodal imaging with the Spectralis HRA plus OCT, I want to call Ethan Priel from Israel to join us. Israel is the founder and director of the ophthalmology department of the, at the MOR Institute in Israel, a leading state-of-the-art diagnostic and treatment center. For several years, Ethan has been talking about importance of multimodal imaging and where better to do this than here in the workshop channel. So hello, Ethan. I hope you are doing well. And first question to you, can you remember when you had your first ISS with us or formerly known as International Spectralis Symposium. Uh, good morning. If I ask good morning to all the attendees, uh, thank you for inviting me. No, uh, I was not prepared for the history lesson, I'm, I must admit. I don't remember the first year, but it must have been 15, 16 years ago. I think it has been several times that you joined ISS with us, and I'm really happy to have you here in our program. And thank you. We all can't, can't wait to, to hear your first talk and listen to you. So then I would ask the, the Regie to start the first presentation and we are happy to listen to Ethan to his first talk. Thank you, Matthias. As soon as you load up the talk. Yes, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, unique opportunity to participate in a virtual imaging symposium. It's a far cry from all the meetings we have had over the years where the social aspect was a big uh, component, but alas, we are in different times and we will make the most of them. My talk this morning will be about uh, multimodal imaging, and I would like to take a minute or two to discuss the history of uh, ophthalmic imaging. And, you know, with, with the years of doing these uh, various uh, applications comes some perspective. We started many, many years ago using film, graduating to digital. Uh, once digital arrived, ICG was available. And rapidly after that, in the early 90s, uh, spec uh, confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy arrived with the Heidelberg and other instruments. And that enabled the first truly multimodal imaging platform, if you will. We were able to do both fluorescein and ICG together through the same lens. At the same time, we even invented a cocktail kind of injection, which combined both dyes in one syringe. That was a revolutionary concept and, and practice, which enabled us to understand both the circulatory processes of the retina and the choroid and have them spatially and temporally aligned. We could see different pathologies at the same time in different locations. Once that uh, became standard, uh, there were more applications added onto the spectralis, then at that point called the HRA, the Heidelberg Retina Angiogram. And, and with the years, more imaging modalities became available, high magnification and dynamic angiographies, and started using uh, autofluorescence for diagnostic uh, purposes as well. 
once OCT arrived on the scene, it, it changed the whole perspective. And then within a few years, OCT and geography arrived in multicolor. And that's where my talk enters. At this point in time, where we have one instrument which combines many, many imaging modalities. So my first talk will not so much delve into each imaging modalities in depth, but rather show how they complement each other and how by being, I said, would say inquisitive, we can get a lot more out of every imaging session. And with that, I would like to start. The take home message that multimodal imaging is a comprehensive imaging platform inviting growth as new overlapping imaging modalities come of age. Now, simultaneous imaging allows us to look at fluorescein and OCT, fluorescein and ICG, or fluorescence, and these multiple imaging modalities increase our understanding and knowledge. The second thing to remember is that every picture tells a story. And we should always look more and look twice and look to the right and left and look a little deeper and a little higher. Because as busy as our clinics are, if we take another second or two, we will come upon a new revelation which enables us to get more uh, information and, of course, better treatment for our patients. Run movies in large, basically be inquisitive, and most importantly, enjoy every session. So if you start with a very simple OCT scan, nothing really dramatic on the run-of-the-mill everyday scan, and we run an ultra-wide field fluorescein angiogram, we are immediately confronted with the fact that one is not enough. Of course, looking at the center of the macula with an OCT does not give us information about the periphery, but this is just a, one example of what happens when we explore additional modalities. If we take it to the other extreme, looking at OCT and geography versus high magnification, we can see similar perifovial vascular anatomical landmarks with a simple lens added onto the spectralis. So just with these two examples, it's possible to see that by combining imaging modalities, we can explore new frontiers. Now, once more, looking at a simple OCT image with a, an innocuous infrared image on the left, which is our standard infrared image, we will discuss infrared at length a little later. We can magnify that image and look at the infrared image on the left and magnify it further and run a movie. Now, I know the lens was not intended for taking movies, but magnifying and running a movie, we can see the blood column flow in the infrared image, which was taken out of the OCT. So once again, when we have all these tools, some would say toys at our disposal, exploring becomes a very, very interesting opportunity. So what is multimodal imaging? taking an unremarkable fundus image in color and finding out that under fluorescein, we have remarkable findings. The color image on the left shows nothing dramatic. Fluorescein early, early and late shows multifocal leakage points on central serous core retinopathy. Top on the right, some pigmentary changes, maybe a small pigment epithelial detachment, again, not visible on color. So the first generation multimodal imaging before the spectralis arrived was combining fluorescein after color or a clinical image. Our players include blue reflectance we will discuss, fundus autofluorescence, fluorescein, ICG angiography, OCT, multicolor, ultra wide field, high magnification, and of course, OCT angiography. We saw a few of those in the introduction and now we'll go one by one and see how they add to our understanding as we combine imaging modalities. So the first up is looking at confocal blue reflectance, which is abbreviated as CBR. It used to be called red-free on fundus images. It used a green light to highlight basically hemorrhages, neurofibrillar layer, and it's helpful in many diseases. It's non-invasive. We perform a before angiography. New applications are emerging, and it's essential to be in focus. Now, 
Two things to remember here. It's best to use after dilation. And any opacities in the way, either corneal or lenticular, will degrade the image. And why is focus so important? Because we're looking at confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopy, which means by the name that once things are in focus, we get the best image. And since this is a workshop channel, we have to remember that focusing is by the brightest image received. In order to focus best with the spectralis, you need to get the brightest image on the screen. That's where your focus is. Even if it's a little hazy, that's where you're at the focal plane. And there's no better way to explain how important focus is than by looking at a confocal blue reflectance image. Here is a simple epiretinal membrane. It's a classic image. I show it often, but it explains dramatically how important focus is. This is a movie taken with a CBR, and we can make the epiretinal membrane disappear. By changing the focus, changing the focal plane, we can now bring back that ERM. Since each diopter of focus is about 300 microns in the eye, it's evident that changing focus by even one or two diopters can take us significantly away from our focal plane which here, in this case, is at the interface between the retina and the vitreous. Where else is confocal reflectance helpful? Looking at leakage, peripherally temporal in the fluorescein, we'll notice that if we turn on our blue light before the dye injection, in MAC tail cases, we will notice there's a white halo surrounding the macula. Different degrees of surrounding, but still, that's what we get. In almost all MACTEL cases, if you image them with confocal blue reflectance, you will notice there's a white halo around the macula, even before pathological vessels appear, even before changes appear in OCT. Important to remember, not only for nerve fiber layer and epiretinal membranes, confocal blue reflectance is really, really instrumental in diagnosing MACTEL. Let's not forget, though, as dramatic as it is, that it's not autofluorescence. And that's our second non-invasive imaging modality. This is the same patient, same setting, same lens, if you will. But as we know, the focal plane is essential. The image on the right, the reflectance, shows us a dramatic epiretinal membrane. The image on the left shows us autofluorescence which, as we will learn, looks at a deeper layer of the retina. The epiretinal membrane is all but invisible on the autofluorescence image. We might notice some striations visible here, but nothing as dramatic as seen on the confocal blue reflectance image on the right. Now, I'm not sure if my mouse pointer is showing, but I'll assume it is. So, autofluorescence modality. For many years, it's received a lot of airtime, and justifiably so. I find it a fascinating imaging modality, which adds a lot to our understanding. I'll show a couple of cases to use them as a kind of a primer, if you will, instruction book to how to use and understand autofluorescence. Again, before injecting the dye, again with dilation. We can still get away with some autofluorescence without dilation, but it's a little tricky because the pupil constricts under the bright light. The images offer us insights into primarily degenerative and inflammatory processes affecting the RPE health. Now, the beauty of autofluorescence is that it will show us the different stages of RPE health according to the level of disease affecting the RPE. Now, autofluorescence records, or for instance, imaging records light generated from lipofusin, which is a fluorophore in the RPE. It allows us follow up over time, and it's not invasive. We can even run movies showing the progression of autofluorescence damage seen in the RPE. So one example, color photography and fluorescein do not show us anything close to what we see in autofluorescence. We will go through this for a second and showing us that 
the dark areas and the gray areas and the white areas, each one of these different areas, the white, gray, and black, tell a different story. For starters, we have area number one on the bottom, which surrounds the central macular region. We have a number two white area and three black. And each one of these areas is basically an encyclopedia in itself explaining RPE health. The number one area, the gray kind of ground glass appearance is normal RPE, uniform grayish appearance of light returned from the RPE. The number two white area highlighted with white arrows is the area where the RPE is distressed and diseased. While effusion generated, we have an increased signal in fundus autofluorescence. It turns out to be white. And the dark area, the black heart shape and island shape there, marked as number three, those are areas where the RPE is dead or absent. And if it's absent, no light is generated, no effusion is present, we get black. In photography, white means there's some activity. We have actually tickled or stimulated the receptor or the film plane. Black means an absence of light. So neither the fluorescein on the left and the bottom or the color top right can show us areas of disease activity, whereas autofluorescence dramatically shows that. I think I have one more. Oh, there's another example, actually, marrying autofluorescence to OCT. And here's where we get truly multimodal imaging in action. We can take our knowledge of autofluorescence, showing different areas of activity in autofluorescent images, and combine and compare them to those seen in OCT. So as we had before, we have areas one, two, and three. We will combine those, looking at number one on the left on autofluorescence, that coincides to number one seen on OCT where the normal RPE is present. Area number two seen in yellow, it's white. In the autofluorescence, we have increased activity and it shows irregular distressed RPE seen on the OCT image. And of course, what is to follow is the area of absent RPE black seen as a denuded RPE on the OCT image on the right. So multi multimodal imaging teaches us of both imaging modalities. In this case, one plus one turns out to be three. We learn more about each imaging modality. And most importantly, we get confirmation. So as when we look at one of the imaging modalities, we immediately understand what it means. Activity, disease, or normal OCT and autofluorescent images seen in various images. Now, next up, we will look at an invasive imaging modality and how that turns out to be multimodal as well. Fluorescent in geography has been here forever, but there was a practicing it for 40, 50 years. It was a standard of the industry for many, many decades. It's available, of course, in all kinds of applications. High magnification, dynamic angiographies, stereo, peripheral shots, you name it. We started with a very standard 30-degree lens many years ago, turning into wide-angle cameras, variable-angle cameras. And today, we have ultra-wide field imaging in fluorescein and geography as well. What's nice about it, it can be done simultaneously. In this slide, I like to show because fluorescein adds to the understanding of OCT. By looking at the fluorescein and placing the scan over a highlighted, possibly leaking lesion, just adjacent to the foveal border, we find confirmation in OCT showing us a wrap lesion. So these are taken simultaneously, as we know, fluorescein with OCT. We do fewer fluorescein angiograms these days, but it gives us more time to put the OCT scan on top of the fluorescein in order to understand both imaging modal modalities better. A couple more examples. Looking at a scan in OCT, which shows us nothing interesting on the top left, if we do an ultra-wide field image, we'll notice variations in the retinal blood vasculature in the periphery. I have several presentations showing, showing that relying on OCT alone can be a mistake. We are now kind of, shall we say, selling ourselves short and not relying more on fluorescein in many cases. 
but alas, that's the march of the times. And if any of you are still doing fluorescein, I urge you to explore the periphery. Now, once we moved up into ICG and geography, we were able to look at the choroid, which was then, until then, only visible if we had scars or very thin retina or myopic patients, we would not be able to see the choroidal vasculature. If you were lucky using film, the first second of dye injection before the RPE became suffused, we could see a glimpse of the choroidal circulation. The longer wavelength passes through opacities, blood, and the RP. This is my um, ICG slide, university slide. This will explain all we need to know about understanding and comparing ICG to fluorescein. Now, there are four attributes which differentiate fluorescein from ICG. The first one, as mentioned, is that we can see choroidal vasculature under ICG illumination, the infrared light with the dye injection, not visible in fluorescein. Secondly, where there is fluid, we get blocked information. Whereas a fluorescein, that fluid will take up the fluorescein and show us some staining and possibly some leakage. With ICG, it blocks the view of the choroid. Optic nerve heads stay black throughout the study of ICG, whereas they take up light stain in fluorescein, as you'll see in the left image. And fourth, little less known, you will notice that blood vessels in the late stage of ICG and geography turn black. That's because the dye molecule does not adhere and stain the vessel walls as the hyperactive fluorescein molecule does. So when we look at an image, we can immediately tell that it's ICG, either by seeing the choroidal vessels or late stage blood vessels in the retina turning black. That helps us understand what we're looking at. Now, of course, comparing ICG with OCT allows us to understand structural findings we noticed on ICG and geography. Let's hope this movie runs. Uh, for some reason, that movie is not running. But we will just look at these single OCT and ICG image showing us elevation, where we have hemorrhages and leakage on ICG. Let's see if the movie runs. So let's move on to our next order of business and look at a kind of confusing imaging modality. With OCTA, we needed to start learning again how to look at images, not only early and late phases, not only leakage and staining and pooling as we did with fluorescein, but we needed most importantly to start looking at different layers of the retina. To me, OCTA and geography is most striking contribution is the ability to differentiate between circulation present in different layers. And this cartoon explains it, you know, I think pretty well. Two people can look at the same OCT angiograph and get different results altogether. So what are we looking at? It records blood component movement in retinal vessels. Movement is color-coded as white on OCT angiography. It's, of course, possible to evaluate some conditions without injecting a dye. But we have no dynamic angiography. We have no leakage, no staining, no pooling. But we see whether they're perfused vessels or not, but most importantly, where these vessels are. And later on during this meeting, we will have more in-depth talks about OCT angiography. But here I'd like to show how it combines to other imaging modalities. So we're talking about layers and how do we know what we're looking at. You know, near vascularization above the retina should be visible immediately with OCT angiography because it shows movement. But we need to know where we're looking. Let's introduce multicolor, where dark means elevated. If we place OCT angiography on top of that area, we will not see anything unless we move our imaging slab, marked by red here, above the retina. The left scan is looking at the surface of the retina, and there's nothing visible right above that blood vessel. The right image shows us the slab moved up anteriorly into the vitreous. We have a white hot spot. Everything else is black because we're not at that plane, not analyzing that plane. One more example of a similar case where we have neovascularization and fluorescein. OCT shows us nothing. 
That's kind of surprising. We were expecting to see a dramatic view of that neurovascular frond. Instead, OCTN geography shows us only the small retinal venules. Now, the reason, of course, is where we are looking. The first scan on the left is looking at the retinal surface with the retinal venules. The second scan is the same scan. Actually, the slab is only moved, and the workshop will show us how to move that. The second slab is moved up anteriorly. You see this dotted red line with our red rectangle? Shows us dramatic neurovascular findings. So the most important thing, in my view, is after we have acquired the scans in OCTN geography, is to make sure we understand what we are looking at, primarily where we are looking at this return signal. And don't forget the white means motion. Now, we can get many clues from our infrared images and use them to guide us for OCTN geography. More about that in our second talk. So we have a suspect spot right under the arcade. And we replace our OCT angiograph over there and move our slab anteriorly, we'll see the new vessels. OCTB scan then will enable us to understand we're looking at a vessel into the vitreous. So in case we have only OCTB scans and OCT angiography, we will be able to learn from this multimodal imaging what we are looking at. We have a dark masking effect on infrared, put a B-scan on that, something protruding into the, into the vitreous, suspect new vessel. Oh, and I said look twice with multimodal imaging. We have a hazy image on the left. If we explore and use our machine to its fullest and pull it back, we can look at the anterior segment as well. I'd like to take a moment to discuss anterior segment imaging because multimodal means also looking at other parts of the eye. In this case, we have a dislocated IOL, which caused this shadow, which was not a, uh, a lid or an eyelid, on the left in the fluorescein. So by pulling a camera back and changing the focus and look at the anterior segment. A couple of examples, another hazy image in fluorescein made the photographer look at the front of the eye. An irregular pupil to be, uh, just put it mildly. Let's turn our fluorescein onto that. The irregular pupil is dramatic, but at one o'clock we'll see some leakage. And if we place our OCT scan on top of the fluorescein image of the interior segment, we're looking at a bleb, which shows up here almost like cystic spaces in a retinal scan, but we're looking at an interior segment bleb. We have the fluorescein leakage on the left. You can even notice the non-fluorescent eyelashes. And we have the corresponding OCT image on the right. Multimodal multi imaging at its best. Um, I'd like to share a few technical tips, seeing this is our technical session. Three to be exact. First of all, it's important when looking for small, minute changes with the OCT is to be right on fovea with your scan. Being right on fovea enables you to find the smallest changes in the deeper retinal layers. And a couple of examples, one scan looks foveal, the second scan is even better foveal. And if we magnify that, we'll see that this looks like a normal scan, but this one shows us a subfoveal absent area, right subfoveal there in the outer retinal layers. And the trick is to find that small hyperreflective artifact in the center of the fovea. It is sometimes not visible if there are multiple opacities, but in most patients, it's possible to see. So unless you're finding some very frank and dramatic pathology, if you're looking for small, minute changes, being right on target in the fovea will enable you to find those. In this case, we're looking at a laser pointer injury. And those can be very, very small and with tricky patients, mostly children. So it's important to be right on target. The second point is what's called pattern recognition. We are now using primarily OCT for many, many cases where we should have been using multimodal imaging with fluorescein and ICG. But by using multimodal imaging, it would be, if you will, reverse engineering, 
we can learn to identify patterns. And macular maps, in cases of branch retinal vein occlusions, show elevations in one quadrant more than others. So a couple of examples. We have extensive elevation on the map, and we have cystoid macular hydration on the OCTB scan. Now, it's a little difficult to make a diagnosis based on the map only, but if we add fluorescein, we'll notice an inferior temporal branch vein occlusion. And another example, different quadrant, again, cystic hydration, and again, a branch vein occlusion in the same corresponding quadrant. So with time and enough cases, it's possible to build up a kind of a multimodal imaging diagnostic library of showing us that even if there's no cystic hydration, but there's only elevation in one quadrant, we're looking at a branch vein, most likely at a branch vein occlusion. So I urge you all, if you get these patterns of singular, only one quadrant elevation on a map, to kind of look and see what a fluorescein would generate. Eventually, a pattern emerges. The second pattern I'd like to share with you is discussing what color coding we use for our scans. Now, it's a question that's been around for many years. Do we use OCT black and white or white on black? I have always been using black on a white background for many reasons. Using white on black has drawbacks if you're printing. It uses a lot of ink. I've also found that looking at white scans on a black background, tend, we tend to lose some information. The black seems to kind of crowd us and mark out some of our understanding. It's easy to change, very easy to change. And there's some cases where I have found that no matter what your preference is, using black and white can give you a better clue and a better chance of diagnosis. So in arterial occlusions, as a case in point, I have found that using the black on white really helps arrive at the diagnosis. Let's look at a couple of examples. Here is a map showing us an elevation not like a branch retinal vein occlusion. It much more follows the arcade eventually arriving at the macula. There's thickening. And this is our classic picture of a combined branch retinal vein occlusion. Now, a multicolor image showing us an edematous retina is always an added bonus. And if we take another case, again, it's not in a quadrant, but mostly following along the vessels. Another classic multicolor image showing an arterial occlusion. And a third case, an unfortunate occlusion at the ciliorenal artery junction. Fluorescein gives us more information. It's nice to follow. We even have a composite image showing us the late stages. What I'd like to show you is how do we write the diagnosis without fluorescein angiography? This could have been tricky. Here is what most people we use as a single scan outside of a map. And I think we would all agree there's nothing really dramatic here in the single OCT scan. I'm not looking at the map of the thickness, just the single scan. And unfortunately, many places, you know, make do with this. But what happens when you reverse the color? I'm looking at black on a white background. And if I compare, I think you will notice that black on white, the edematous retina stands up much more. So multimodal imaging is not just combining fluorescein and OCT. Multimodal imaging is really understanding how to best use your platform to get the accurate diagnosis. In another case, we saw earlier, here is what most clinics would use. Here's what we use, and I think you'll notice a pattern emerging. The compromised, thickened, hyperfluorescent inner retinal layers show up much more dramatically on the black and white. So, in summary, I'd like to point out that we should tailor our imaging protocol to pathology. 
if we are not sure about something, we see an OCT or blue reflectance or autofluorescence, fluorescein might be the tool of choice. When using OCT and geography, we should understand and remember it's multimodal with infrared and multicolor and fluorescein and ICG. The learning curve can be long, but it'll be very rewarding if we combine it with other imaging modalities. Remember, white means motion. That's the most important take-home message about OCT and geography, what layer we are looking at. And of course, it adds interest to our day. The ability to take a switch and flick it and look at different areas of the retina or the choroid or combine two imaging modalities and have an aha moment really makes our work much more fun-filled. Oh, one more thing. Three minutes of stereo imaging, which deliver uh, striking images, both of fluorescein and ICG. It's excellent for teaching. And for those of you who have been at actual live in-person meetings, we have noticed that stereo imaging adds so much to our lectures and understanding of pathology. We take two images with the spectralis, a left and right image. There's a built-in anaglyph creation button on the bottom we can discuss in the workshop live demos. And we have the resulting audience put on their glasses. And so please, everybody, put on your red-green glasses now. This is the time to use the glasses so we can see the stereo images. And I hope you can all see the elevated, large, neovascular membrane present here, which takes up the whole area of the macula. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I realize you're not not all of you have glasses. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's take a little sidetrack. Since you might not all have eyeglasses, red cyan, we can still enjoy stereo online. And this is a case where, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Being sidelined from giving lectures which show stereo, we had to improvise and come up with this technique. And I hope you can all see the stereo effect of a neurosensory elevation with an RP defect at five o'clock to the fovea. All without glasses in the comfort of your home. How is that done? Choose two images, left, right images, which make up a stereo pair, insert into a black PowerPoint, into a blank PowerPoint slide, one on top of the other. Then activate by clicking on just the top image. Using the effects, give it a blink option. Replace it one on top of the other. And this is what we get. Full screen stereo effect by using a PowerPoint Highlight, ICG showing a retinal detachment, ICG showing a pigment epithelial detachment, autofluorescence. When you have extreme elevations, we can use autofluorescence for the same effect if the internal components of the elevation are autofluorescing, of course. Fluorescein with, of course, neovascularization in the vitreous and the vitreous hemorrhage. Fluorescein, I think just about the end, I have one more, showing a macroaneurysm which bled. So by using a simple technique with our fluorescein and ICG, we can arrive at a better understanding of retinal choroidal anatomy using stereo imaging online presentations. Thank you very much. And I hope we have time for some questions. Thank you very much, Ethan. So I think you showed us that even when we think that we can do some good images, we are really far away from being experts. <laughs> so I really can't believe how you did this last images with the stereo effects. This is really awesome that you did. And, you know, we, we all <laughs> admire you when, when looking <clears throat> at your multimodal images. And even though it's, it's only a few principles that you have to, to keep in mind, 
um, it needs a lot of experience and years of experience to, to have those uh, brilliant images that you always show up. So it's really, really awesome. It's a pleasure. So I would like to pass over now to, to Grit, who is my colleague from the clinical trainer team. And the questions that maybe come up um, within the next uh, hour um, we will have in the discussion round at the end. So the last five to 10 minutes, we will have a small discussion with Ethan and with Grit all together. So please don't hesitate to type in your questions that we will discuss then at the end. So now it's a pleasure to have Grit with me. Hi, Grit. We are all happy that you will show us now the basics in, in retinal imaging. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. So let's start. First of all, thanks, Ethan, for this fantastic talk. And some of those modalities Ethan talked about, I am going to show you now. The second part is after our lunch break together with uh, Andreas. Uh, so yeah, just stay here, right here, <laughs> OK? Um, yes, I'm glad that you are all here. And here we have our wonderful device, which I'm going to explain you within the next 50 minutes, circa, OK? Um, and I'd like to start with simple OCT imaging we can do with a spectralis, OK, in our first part. And what we are going to do first is a um, yeah, basic OCT examination when our patient first visits us. And my dear patient is my dear colleague Henry, who volunteers to be a patient today my uh, VIS patient, as you can see on screen, right in a second. <laughs> and I'm going to start the examination, and you can have a look on that with me, OK? So I'd like to share the screen. I hope it's working well. And before we can do any measurement, we have to position our patient and explain what he or she is allowed to do and what he or she has to do during the measurement, okay? So before, of course, I cleaned all the surfaces. And now, Henry, I'd like you to come forward and place your chin in the chin rest, the forehead in the other rest. And what we have to do is to place our patient's eyes right in line to the little mark which all of you know, and uh, yeah, Henry, I kindly ask you during the measurement, always keep your contact to the forehead rest and look right into the device. There is a blue cross and you're allowed to blink. So if you need to blink, just blink. A good tear film is crucial for this measurement. So if your patient has a dry eye problem, you're allowed to use uh, artificial tears, okay? So let's start the acquisition window. Right now my patient is seeing the blue cross inside the device. And what we are seeing here on our screen is a little, yeah, bright reflection. And this is the first reflection we get from our patient's retina, okay? So what we are doing is we measure with the help of light. So the first thing is we need to get all of the light right into our patient's eye. And this is what we are doing right now. We can imagine our patient's pupil as kind of a keyhole we want to look right through, okay? And what we have to do for that is keeping the camera right in front of this keyhole, not too far right, not too far left or something like that. And this is what we are doing by centering this little reflex. I'm moving the camera from the left to the right right now. And if I have it right centered, then I am allowed to move forward. We are moving towards our keyhole just to get a greater field of view. And we are moving forward just until we have an evenly illuminated image, just like that, okay? All of our four corners are evenly illuminated. So that was the first step. Second step is we want to have the focus of the light we have now right into the eye, right on the level of the retina. And this is what we can do by turning this focus knob on the camera. And this is what we are doing right now. 
in one direction we see mm, not that good but in the other direction just turn it as your image becomes brightest and as sharp as you can get it okay so all those small details you can see here right in the macular center they should be as sharp as possible okay and this is what Ethan mentioned before if you have the brightest image there you have all the light right in place okay mm. Mm. and what we can do right now is just having a simple infrared SLO image if you would like to for that I'll start the um, averaging of our images just to get a higher quality of this infrared image I do this by pushing the black button on the um, touch panel. If you have a device which has a joystick, you can do it by pressing it two seconds, then the uh, averaging is started. And yeah, you can see in this great picture, in this uh, big picture on the right, this average nice infrared um, SLO image. I will save it by clicking acquire or you will do it uh, with the joystick by a short press. And yeah. That's how we get the first perfect image, okay? What we are going to do now is, yeah, just combine it with OCT. And we are doing this by turning this OCT button on. And our image is um, on the right side. You can see it right here, okay? So what we've already done is getting light into the eye, getting it focused right on the retina. And what we are doing now is just um, adjusting our OCT within our OCT window on the right. And you can see those four blue brackets in the upper half of the window. And if you want to do it perfectly, you have to uh, place your OCT right there. If you're too far away, maybe there will be some additional noise in the picture. If you're moving too close to your patient, then, so I move the camera towards the patient now, then maybe some structures are cut off. So what we want to do is imaging the whole retina, okay? So therefore it has to be there in this window, okay? So I ask my patient now to exactly look in the center of the blue cross. And what we have here is this single line scan. You can see it, it's 30 degrees in width. And it is this scan which uh, shows us the foveal uh, structure and um, architecture perfectly, okay? So for that, it needs to be right perfectly in the fovea, okay? Uh, what we want to do as well is to have um, as yeah, little noise as possible, okay? And this is what we can do. You always have this little uh, speckle noise around here. And for getting rid of this, we are activating our eye tracking again. And for that, this um, averaging. For this line scan, we are doing an averaging of 100 frames. So what we can see here in the upper right is our perfectly averaged line scan image. And this is what we want to keep. So I'll acquire that image right now. Of course, we are not only able to do one single line scan, we can um, have uh, some pattern we can use. Commonly used is the dense scan pattern for just having a closer look on the macular region, okay? It's 20 times 20 degrees uh, in size and it's covering our macular region. So I'll do this now. It's important as well that this scan is placed right in the center of our retina again. Yeah, blink again, my dear patient. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And what we can do if our patient might is not able to see the center of the blue cross, for example, he's just seeing the upper part of the cross. May I ask you to look? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. But we want him, but we want our scan to be just centered right on the phobia. What we can do is again push the um, active eye tracking button. And then we have here our scan pattern. We have the center of the pattern right here. And in the infrared image in the background, you can see the fovea, or at least where all uh, vessels are directing to there is the fovea. And we can now move our scan pattern right to that location. 
And what we see on the right is that we have our uh, fovea in the center of our scan again. And then we check in the live image that you see at the uh, lower corner of your uh, screen if everything is all right, the eye is evenly illuminated, and our OCT scan position is perfectly. So now let's start the scan by pushing the acquire button. And then for this dense scan pattern, 49 um, line scans are performed on this area automatically. Okay, so there's no need to worry if your patient can't see maybe the whole cross or the whole target inside the device, you are able just to move around the scan. What you have to keep in mind as well is, um, yeah, you, um, you're looking for a pattern that uh, fits the pathology size, for example. You can adjust your scan patterns however you want them to be, okay? So let's stay here with this dance scan and imagine your pathology is uh, a little bit bigger than this 20 times 20 degrees, okay? Then you have this little, little yeah, kind of craft corner right here. And here you can see, this is the size 20 times 20 degrees of our dance scan. But if you'd like to, you can just change its height and just make it a little bit bigger. So maybe if the pathology is bigger, you can cover it with this bigger scan pattern, okay? What we have here as well, are different other preset scan patterns. For example, this fast scan. With this fast scan, only every second line is scanned compared to the dense scan. So you have to keep in mind that yeah, less information is collected with this fast scan, but yeah, it's fast. So maybe it's suitable for um, less um, cooperating patients. And on the other side, or on the other hand, we have this detail scan right here. So much information on a very small area. So this is a very detailed scan if you really want to know everything around uh, about this little area, okay? If you have a patient, if you imagine a patient who maybe has some, um, yeah, vitreomacular traction or adhesion and you want to have a look on the fovea architecture from different views, then you want to use a radial scan, aren't you? So, uh, so we can create this radial scan right here in our craft corner as well, and we can save it as a custom pattern. So let's do that for now. We want to have, you can close your eyes if you want to, thank you. <laughs> um, we want a radial scan pattern. That is what we can choose right here. What you can see now is that it consists already out of uh, six sections, okay? Six is too low for me, so I'd like to have 12 section covering this uh, radial uh, scan, and it should be only 15 degree in width, okay? Each line should be um, averaged not only nine times, because it's a foveal scan, I'd like to have a high quality scan, and I'd like to have 20 times in averaging for each scan line, okay? And if I have collected all this information on my scan pattern, I have those four free uh, custom buttons right here. And if I keep it, if I hold down my left mouse button right here, a dialogue comes up and I'll give a name to this scan, maybe just name it star, and I'll save this scan right here. So for now, we uh, are able just to use the star scan like our dance scan, okay? If you now click on that button, this pattern is saved and you can use it again and again. So let's do this star, star pattern right now, okay? So I illuminate my eye again. I just have a closer look on the right side on my OCT image and it's important that this red dotted line right here is um, following this foveal dip you can see here, okay? Because if it isn't, our star is not located correctly, okay? Good, so check this position. To be really sure, first start the eye tracking, check if your position is correct, and if it is correct, then acquire the scan by pressing the acquire button 
or pressing your button on the uh, joystick shortly. Okay, I'll do, um, I think I have done my first uh, scans for this patient in his first visit, in his baseline visit. And what we are going to do now is a short quality check of our images, okay? Let's do this. Okay, so here we see our baseline images of our patient. And what we want to know is if our quality is uh, quite good. So what the scan should look like is that we have the whole retina shown right here, that we did capture the whole retina in each and every scan line. If we have our dense scan right here, you can scroll through the images and check if each and every scan line is uh, correct. And we want to have a good quality of the images. So this uh, number on the lower right corner, you can see this Q value and it should be above 25 for a good image, but it's regarding uh, of the patient and his or her um, optic media, if they are clear enough, you know. Okay, but for now, I think those uh, baseline images are quite good. As you can see, our star shape pattern is really um, right in the fovea, and you can imagine that uh, we have the possibility here to detect even the smallest change in this foveal architecture. What we want to do now is to teach the device to remember this scan position. And this is what we are doing by set reference, okay? So we um, just um, highlight those uh, images, doing a right click right into the blue section and choose uh, progression and set reference and our images get those small red um, squares right here. And this small square says, yes, I remember this scan position again. And what we are going to do now is a follow-up scan for you just to remember. A follow-up scan is really important. If we do a follow-up scan, we are able to position the scan exactly in the same position as the last time and therefore compare really the same structure and can see how it changed, okay? So let's do this. I'll just go on with this examination and we will see what has changed now. So just come back <laughs> again. Thank you. And I'll activate the OCT again. And what we can see now for our WIS patient this button now is active, okay? And this is the follow-up button. So I'll push this and we see those three scans we did for the baseline uh, visit. These are now available right here. And if I choose one of those, you can see down here, there you have an overview where the focus was the last time. You can see what the OCT looked like the last time. And now you know that, uh, yeah, the device remembers the retina of our patient. And this is what we are going to see now. You have for now this uh, line here in red. And as I get closer to my patient's eye, the device says, whoa, I remember this retina and turns blue and positions the scan right in place. Okay, so if my patient just um, has a different position of its head right in the chin rest, that doesn't matter because the scan is turning in this direction, okay? So what we have to do now is illuminate the eye, get everything into the correct focus, and uh, position our scan. And for the line scan, we have to activate our um, active real-time eye tracking and averaging, and then just acquire that scan. And then you can see in this follow-up section, yes, we've done the first one, and we can go on with the different other ones. For example, our uh, dance scan we did um, with our patient looking a little bit upwards. Today, everything is fine. He's seeing the whole target inside the device again. And this 
scan is just in the correct position again, okay? So everything you do quite good for the baseline visit is uh, done for you for each and every follow-up visit, okay? So just start the acquisition and the scan is done. Okay, so as you can see, if you've done a very good baseline exam, the rest is just easy, isn't it? So let's have a closer look what you can see now additionally in the viewing module. First, you can see that this little uh, symbol has changed. It's not a red square, it's now a, a yellow square between two white squares. And um, within the viewer, you have the possibility to click in the, oh yes, in the lower left corner, you have this third symbol, which says compare two scans of the progression series. And this is what it is now. We have a progression series. There you can uh, display both scans um, together and see what changed, okay? You are able to flicker around right here and let's have a closer look on that for with a patient who maybe has something um, in his um, history. So, for example, this branch retinal vein occlusion right here, okay? If we have a closer look on that line scan done upside, uh, in a 90 degree position, there you have this uh, really um, edemous retina. And if we want to see the change, how it has been the last time in the upper part, you have the reference image. So hit the last visit of the patient, in the lower part, the uh, actual visit. And you can flicker around between both images, maybe if the change is a little bit smaller. In this case, it just uh, was there. So no need to flicker at all. But what you can do as well is if we choose a volume scan, there you can receive some thickness maps out of it. And you can compare both thickness maps of both visits with each other and uh, have this retina thickness change map in the lower right so that you can see at one look on this if something has changed and in which direction, okay? So uh, yeah, if the retina is getting thicker, if there is swelling in terms of retina, it's not that good. And yeah, if it uh, decreases, then it's good. Okay, so that was the first part. If there are any questions, just feel free to type them in, okay? I'll go on if there are no questions. Yeah, <laughs> good. I'll go on with uh, multicolor and uh, autofluorescence imaging right now, okay? Mm. Ethan explained the multicolor imaging perfectly, okay? So what we are doing is what we already or always have with uh, OCT imaging is our reference image, um, which is the infrared image, okay? So we are using this wavelength as well for multicolor imaging, but we are having uh, two additional wavelengths, okay? And they are shorter to get information not only from the RPE level, but also from the surface of the retina. And as long as they have a different wavelength, they are having also a different focus on the retina. So all the, pre what, why am I telling you? <laughs> all the preparation you have to do for the measurement is first of all, checking your focus and finding your perfect focus in the infrared image and then just do a defocus of minus one diopter to get all of those three wavelengths imaged in a perfect way, okay? And this is what we are going to do first. So I'll start a new measurement for my patient. And now we want to do some multicolor imaging and start a new measurement. Good. So, may I ask you? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Okay. Good. So now let's have a closer look on the left eye. And again, we have this small um, reflection right here. We keep it centered while moving forward with the camera towards the patient's eye. And first of all, we'd like to have evenly illuminated, uh, an evenly illuminated infrared image. Second, we want to have all of our light right on the retina, ideally. Okay, may I ask you to blink again and again and again and again? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. So, and as I said before, when we found out what the perfect focus for our patient is in infrared, we just say, okay, from that value that you can find in the lower left of your acquisition window, you just um, do a defocus of minus one diopter. Okay, so for this, I will just do that check my illumination again, and then we are able to change our uh, application we are using. And we are checking, first of all, if the filter wheel position is right. Of course, this is crucial as well, okay? For, if you want to do a multicolor image, you have to check the filter wheel position if it is in R for reflectance imaging, okay? And then, you can choose infrared and uh, click on the multicolor uh, button here. And I just, uh, yeah, kind of tell my patient that the light is going to be a little bit brighter now. Okay, good. Just keep staring to the blue cross. <laughs> and now I activated the multicolor. We check our illumination. It looks quite good. And what we have to do here is activating the... Uh, just blink again, please. Thank you. And open up your eye. Great. Okay. And what is crucial here is the uh, averaging. So the active eye tracking here is needed to get all the information in this beautiful uh, multicolor image here. Acquire if the image suits for you and then just go back to the infrared, which is invisible to your patient and you like your patient. So just uh, don't uh, have this bright light too long, okay? What we can do as well is uh, just have another area covered, okay? So you can change the internal fixation light to the nasal side and your patient looks right there. And now we illuminate that again. Blink again, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Adjust our focus, of course. And then defocus of minus one, activate our multicolor again, it's gonna be bright, and activate our averaging. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay, so we acquire that picture as well. And as you can see, you can take uh, multicolor images of different areas of the retina. You can do it in wide field as well. This is what we are going to do later on. And of course, you're able to combine multicolor imaging with OCT imaging if you'd like to. It's the same as uh, I showed you before. Due to time, I'll change to the uh, viewing module and show you some cases for the multicolor imaging. And we'll have a close look on the images we did with our patient. Okay, so here's our multicolor imaging. and this is our patient's eye, and what we have here is the infrared channel, the green and the blue channel. And what I'd like to show you is that you get aware that this is a, a color-coded image, okay? And you can just um, change the um, balance of those three channels of colors, okay? And for that, I like to have a closer look on... Mm, a patient who hasn't such a beautiful, perfect eye as my dear colleague. 
and just to show you what it uh, has to offer, okay? So, uh, for example, if we think of uh, something on the surface of the retina, we can think of nerve fiber bundle defects, okay? And that was done for this patient. And as you can see, it appears to have a quite different color balance, and you are right, because the green and blue channel are uh, just more highlighted in that case to see the superficial changes, okay? If we change it to standard, you can see this nerve fiber bundle defect as well, but not as good. So, if you're expecting to have something in the, on the surface, in the superficial layers of the retina, just try the green-blue enhanced um, color balance to have more information on that and just use that we have this color-coded uh, image and you can play around with that, okay? And it can help you to uh, find some special things in this, okay? Second, we'd like to do some uh, blue autofluorescence imaging. And as uh, Ethan explained before as well, we are using the blue light. So for you to take a real good and sharp image is what you need to remember. If you use a light source besides infrared imaging, you always need to do this defocus of minus one, okay? So first of all, find the perfect focus in infrared light and then defocus by minus one diopter, and then you are well prepared to get the perfect image, okay? So this is what we are going to do now. We have our patient right here and just do a new examination and do autofluorescence right now. All right. Good. So, I just illuminate the eye again with the help of the infrared light, of course. Have an evenly illuminated image. Then I just adjust the focus perfectly in infrared and then defocus of minus one. If we want to do an autofluorescence image, we have to change our filter wheel position from R to A, and then we are able to find our blue autofluorescence imaging modality right here, okay? Again, the light is gonna be bright again. Please keep staring at the blue cross inside the device right now. Okay, what we see is just not that much information, but it gets better if we start our eye tracking right here. And what you can see is that the image is getting clearer and sharper right now, okay? And the information is just detected by averaging all those small signals, okay? We acquire the image and we go back to infrared because we like our patients, okay? And don't want them to uh, have this quite bright light into their eyes, okay? So this is how you do the perfect image with the um, blue autofluorescence. Again, you can change direction and to get the uh, image of this area you're interested in, and you can combine it with the OCT imaging as well, and as we saw, in uh, Ethan's presentation as well, okay? So let's have a closer look in the viewer right now, okay? And I'll leave this acquisition module. Okay, again, we are checking this blue autofluorescence image. It looks quite good. My patient is not a patient. <laughs> He's a volunteer. He's healthy. So let's have a closer look on someone who has something to offer. <laughs> Okay, and as Ethan already mentioned, this um, blue autofluorescence can be used to um, detect um, special patterns that build up in each and every pathology. Okay, for example, here we have a, a retinopathia pigmentosa where you lose the activity in the edges of this uh, field of view. And 
you have only uh, some islands left, okay? So you can see those patterns that build up right here. What else can you see or discover with the blue autofluorescent light uh, is Drusen, optic disc Drusen. They have this uh, autofluorescent um, characteristics as well. And if they are not too buried, you can even see them with the blue autofluorescent light. So what we have here in this example is, first of all, a infrared image where you can see the disc looks quite yeah, um, swollen. And if we look at our uh, blue autofluorescence image, there you can see the hyper-autofluorescent optic disc drusen in this picture. So this modality is not just for retinal imaging, it's for optic disc drusen imaging as well. Okay. And of course, if we have a patient that has some um, atrophy in his eye, there we can um, just follow how this atrophy zone grows over time. And you can see uh, how fast this goes on, okay? And maybe just tell the patient what to do next, maybe how you can take care of him, okay? And you can do this with the help of uh, the region finder, which is included if you have the blue autofluorescence modality. So just have a quick, really quick view or look on that. Uh, here you see all the um, blue autofluorescence images you did for this patient. And I'll just show you um, a little hint how everything can be done, okay. So first of all, what you can do is to measure the atrophy zone itself, okay. I just show you for the first image, which I have just chosen for this patient. And here you have this uh, quite good contrasted image. And by double click, you add this atrophy zone by scrolling up. You can fill this atrophy zone. And as you can see in the lower left, the uh, area is calculated. So the size of this zone. And if you do this for the following images or for the following acquisitions, you can just um, see how this uh, develops, okay? So if we choose the second one, we can copy the region we just did and just make it taller if it grew, okay? And this you do for each and every image. If we want then to have a look on the change analysis, we choose this one. And what you can then see here, if you do it for all the measurements, you can see how this uh, area developed over the last few exams. Okay, you can see the rate of change, a change map. And also a real nice uh, thing is the progression movie. If you now watch the upper right image, and if I push the play button, then you can see how this um, atrophy zone grows over time, okay? So this tool, um, just use it if you have it, okay? Especially for uh, follow-up uh, atrophy zones in patients with, um, yeah, developing atrophies, okay? If you have any questions, further questions on that, just, uh, yeah, contact us or your partner <laughs> from Heidelberg Engineering, okay? Are there any questions? No? Good, then we will go on. I'd like to show you the wide field imaging possibility we have, and we'll do some uh, 55 degree lens change now on the spectralis, okay? Uh, right now we've had the 30 degree lens on the spectralis, and we want to have the 55 degree lens right there now. So it's protected by two covers. And I think you know how to change a lens. You just get the 30 degree lens off by turning it around and getting it away from it. And then you here have this red dot, should be upside and just get the objective or the lens on the 
Maybe you can see I'm a little bit nervous right now. Okay. Good. Like that. Okay. And then just turn it around and it's locked. Good. When to use the wide field imaging? We can use it in combination with the multicolor imaging. We can use it uh, if you combine it with the blue autofluorescence, but especially, of course, for angiographies, okay? As long as we are not doing an angiography right now, I will show you the multicolor, or first of all, the infrared image and then the multicolor image, and uh, yeah, some maybe new option for you to do. Okay, so let's have a new examination for our patient. And we will do a 55 degree wide field image. Okay. So, first of all, I will adjust the focus, which maybe is a little bit uh, too high after changing our objective lens and then again we have our patient's eye there this little reflex coming from his retina and we are getting closer now just as we are having an evenly illuminated image again yes as you can see there is a little um reflex in the center okay and there you can see that the tear film maybe is yeah just a little bit stressed due to the studio conditions here <laughs> and yeah so i asked my patient to blink again perfect okay the focus is already quite good we are around this uh yeah zero diopters for that and what we want to do now as you know it is if we want to get a high quality image we push this um, averaging button so our active eye tracking is there and we can do a really nice image in 55 degrees if we want to do now a multicolor image then usually we changed to filter wheel position r and then just changed to multicolor okay uh, a new thing that's going to happen is that we have a new filter wheel in there, which is called wide field reflectance and wide field reflectance. And it's optimized for this multicolor images, especially because you know there might be some yeah, tall um, artifact in the center, and it's possible with that filter wheel position to block that artifact in the center. Okay, and this is what we are going to do now. So you can find this wide field reflectance filter wheel position in position P. And this is what the um, software is telling you as well. So I'll turn or I set the filter wheel position to P. What we can see is, first of all, right here, our artifact just vanished right here, okay, in the infrared imaging. So. But now we want to have some multicolor imaging. And you remember, we can change, first of all, our focus a little bit in direction minus one. And then just maybe activate the HR for the high resolution mode to just have more um, points of measurement in our wider field of view. And then we will, oh, sorry, activate our multicolor imaging. So it's going to be bright again, and let's have a closer look on that. Okay, I just choose to uh, use a little bit more light, get right into the eye, and then we will activate our active eye tracking. And you can see that we have a real nice multicolor image right here. You need some averaging there to get a real nice multicolor image doesn't matter if it is in 30 degree or in 55 degree, okay? And of course, you are able to combine this 55 field, uh, degree field of view with OCT as well. And this is what I'm going to show you now. You can just activate this OCT right here and 
get everything into focus. What you can see is that this yeah, spherical shape of our eyeball, that's why it's called eyeball, uh, gets uh, yeah, more visible here in this greater um, scan size, okay? So maybe it's yeah, more interesting to just uh, set this OCT scan right in this place, but I'm sure you can do it. If uh, you get too close to your patient's eye, maybe you already know this button here. If you change this uh, eyeball size to L, the uh, reference for the OCT scanning is a little bit further away, so you are able to just just move away a little bit with your camera from your patient's eye and are not that close, okay? But for my patient, yeah, that looks good, okay? So I'm gonna do just this line scan right here, having this eye imaged really nice. Okay, this is what you can do. And you, of course, can combine it with uh, multicolor as well and blue autofluorescence as well, okay? so. Remember, white reflectance filter wheel position available soon. So, <laughs> let's have a closer look on some patients and on our white field imaging in general, um, where to use it and um, where it might be really good to have it. As Ethan said, uh, especially when doing an angiography, you really better not miss the periphery, okay? And therefore, for example, use a 55-degree uh, lens or the 102 ultra-wide field imaging modality, okay? And just to show you the difference between 55 and uh, the 102 field of view, this is, for example, suitable especially for uh, diabetic patients uh, because there the periphery is really crucial to see. And here we have the image with the 55 degree wide field lens and next to it a greater field of view that covers just more information. Okay, so this is multimodal imaging. You can change the lenses just as you need them. Okay. Furthermore, you are um, able to do movies with the spectralis, for example, just to capture um, the entrance of the dye right into the vessels of the retina, okay, when starting the angiogram. And this can be quite helpful because you can see how the dye um, yeah, enters the eye, you can see uh, the characteristics, the filling characteristics. Um, of each vessel, okay, and follow that. It's just um, good to have it because there's more information than in just one single image, okay, especially if really much thing change in short time. Okay, last but not least, just in one second, or maybe two, I'd like to give you some tips and tricks for myopic patients, okay? Um, all of you know them probably, that we might have stuffy loma, okay? And usually you will take your camera, you see, okay, on the right corner, this image is not that good. I'll just uh, take my camera to the right side and everything will be fine again, but it's not in stuffy loma, okay? So what you can do here is just uh, change the direction of your scan like this, and then you will be able to uh, see everything in one line again and have no blurry side of the OCT scan, okay? What else can happen in myopic patients is this, okay? There you have this really um, spheric shape, kind of, in this uh, scan length you're using right now. And what you can do is to just uh, avoid imaging this um, area and you can just shorten your scan to get the focus on that information that matters for that patient in that moment without having it that tilted, okay? And how to do that, I just like to show you in the acquisition module where to find those 
important buttons, okay? So, mm, I'd like to have a new examination. I'd like to have the retina acquisition continued, okay? So again, my patient is just healthy. <laughs> and uh, therefore, I just brought you those pictures that you can imagine what it is good for. And I will now show you where to find it, okay? Mm, just a second. Yeah, but yeah, I'll quickly change the lens. Sorry, because this is the most commonly used lens. But then, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Let's do this. I'll activate the infrared and OCT imaging. And there we go. Okay. I illuminate my patient's eye again. And yes, where do you have to look at if you want to change direction of your scan? First of all, have a look right here next to this uh, arch area. There you have the direction of the scan. Now it's set to 180 degree and you just can quickly change its direction up to 90 degree, okay? You remember? If it, is, if, if it was tilted in one direction, in the worst case, it just uh, switches to the other direction now. But what you can do then is grab the um, arrow of your scan in your infrared re reference image and just turn this scan, okay, to the direction. And you're watching your OCT image and hopefully it re reaches one direction where it's really settled evenly, okay? And how to change the length of the scan? This is right in your craft corner right here. There you have the length of the scan and you can just shorten it by pushing the minus sign, okay? And this can be done for each and every scan you can find here. You just can choose a preset scan and uh, change it to your needs, okay? And it's important to do that right from the beginning that it is chosen as you liked it in all follow-up sessions. Okay, good. Then I think we have covered quite a lot and yeah, I will hand over to my dear colleague Matthias again. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Grit. Indeed, there arrived some questions and at first I would like to ask you to, to open this 55 degree multicolor image that you took from our dear patient Henry so that we can see how beautiful these new 55 degree multicolor images really are. Mm -hmm. So without these artifacts that we are used to mm -hmm. in the history. And there was a question related to that. There was a attendee a little bit uh, later joining us and uh, he asked what he has to do. So he um, heard that he has to go to filter wheel position P, but what, what else has he to do? So what is new? Yeah, the new thing is really a new filter wheel in there, okay, with a new um, filter wheel available in position P, okay, <laughs> and this is what you do. Um, in this filter wheel position, the central artifact reflex we are getting, usually in position R, is uh, just shut out, <laughs> okay, by this new filter wheel in there, okay. So first of all, you need a kind of small hardware change. And after that, you're able to do this new multicolor uh, white field reflectance images. Okay? Okay. I only want to add that uh, we wait for CE clarification. So this will be available soon in the CE market, but not in other countries. So we will have to wait a little bit longer when you're not in the CE region. Okay, so then to the next question, I would like to ask you, to open the acquisition window, please. Mm -hmm. And there are two questions uh, for the acquisition window. The first one is, if you could uh, show a really dense and short scan, mm -hmm. so when there's really a 
small change in the fovea, mm -hmm. what scan would you prepare or we prefer to do? Okay. So, first of all, we, we remember that we have different preset scans. And for that, I will choose the detail scan. What you can see here in the corner uh, on the lower right is that this has a uh, area, covers an area of 15 times 5 degree, 49 sections with uh, only 30 microns between two lines in that case, okay? And what you can do here is doing a real dense, dense, detailed scan of the retina, okay? Good. So, be sure if you want to have the fovea in the center, just activate the eye tracking, center your scan perfectly and then start the acquisition. So, the closer each scan line is to the next scan line, the more detailed the information is. So maybe smaller area, okay? Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Um, next question is belonging to illumination and brightness control. So there's the possibility to do it uh, automatically mm -hmm. or to do it manually. Mm -hmm. Can you please show how to um, do the preset for manual adjustments? So um, there's a one possibility to do it only for one examination for the actual one or to do it as a default setting. Yeah. As a default setting, first of all, you can change it right here in the acquisition window, clicking on setup and acquisition parameters, okay? And there you find in the second row, the image brightness control. It's automatic right here. So the system just controls the brightness, but you can set it to manual as well. So there you, you have the control of uh, brightness of the uh, fundus image, okay? So we will leave it here. After activating it and restart the uh, software, then it's active, okay? Otherwise, you can just change it for one examination, maybe in case you need it, okay? And this is done on your touch panel. I will just get it right here. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. And there you have this more button, you press it. And there you find in the first, uh, in the second row, the image brightness, okay? And there you can change between auto and manual. And if we choose manual right now, then I just show you again what happens. Um, then I, if I get closer to the eye, there is a, uh, yeah, <laughs> no automatic brightness control. I have to do it on my own with the help of my uh, touch panel and this small, this uh, black button right here. By turning it around, you can change the brightness of your image, okay? Okay. So, okay, one last question mm -hmm. and we have one minute left. So the question for this, uh, um, scan with uh, many lines in, in a small region belongs uh, to a star scan. Can you please uh, show how to do a star ah, scan okay. uh, with um, maybe 15 degree angle and many lines? Mm -hmm. Of course. Good. So we remember we just created a custom scan pattern, star, and if you want to do this uh, star-shaped pattern in a more dense way, then you just can add some lines into it here in the lower right and just saying, okay, I'd like to have 24 sections or 48 sections, just as you prefer it. And then scan, okay? Mm -hmm. I can perform the scan as well if you'd like to. <laughs> Let's do it with the 24 lines, okay? First, check if the position is perfectly in the fovea. It is, and then acquire your scan. Yes. Okay. So, 
even if you have created your preset scan pattern with less lines, you're just able to add some if you'd like to in that patient spontaneously. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for that. So you showed how important it is to accurately center this uh, star scan. So this is uh, really important to have every single line run through the fovea, which is here very important. So Ethan, unfortunately, no question to your talk at this time. And we are at the end okay. of this first session. So thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Grit, again. I think this has been a wonderful first session on the basic basics of retinal imaging. So please feel free now in the next break to visit our virtual booth or have a look at the Fundus Image Interactive or the Retinal Layers Interactive. We will see you again in half an hour. So at Central European time, it will be 11 in the morning. And next topic will then be Heidelberg Eye Explorer. So see you. <laughs>